at you. So uh, you get to stare at me or have to. Um, so I was uh, thinking when Debbie was talking about Sunday school, uh, and I, I don't mean this as a manipulation, but uh, I think we should think about it, and that is that the devil has no shortage of volunteers that want to reach your children. I don't know why the church should have a shortage. And so you might want to think about that. That um, there, are, there are people everywhere that would love to reach your children with all kinds of vile ideas. And, and are happy to volunteer to work with kids. And so if the righteous don't stand up, what, what are we going to do? So just a reminder, really, and uh, you can do what you want with that. Um, I, I'm, this, I'm just mentioning things that have nothing to do with my sermon real quickly. And, and, you know, so there's the new Oregon mandate about wearing masks again. So what I'd like to say is if this keeps you from assembling together with the saints according to the word of God, you're going to have some big problems in your future when persecution arises. If an inconvenience is a problem for you, I don't know what you're going to do with opposition. And uh, I think we should think in those terms uh, that we're, you know, we're kind of a spoiled group of people. And I don't just mean this church. I mean, our culture uh, is, you know, I've been, I've been a lot of places in the world, and, and I think America is one of the finest countries I've been in. There's no question about that. It, and, and there's a lot of great things about Americans. They're compassionate and generous, and there are a lot of good qualities, but they are the whiniest bunch of people I have ever met anywhere in the world. And I think that be, it would be really good to change that reputation. So, and, and at least change it with me. So, uh, you know, if, you, if you're not going to change your global reputation, just fool me and don't whine to me, and, and at least I can be blissfully ignorant. So let's, let's get into the sermon this morning so we, we don't waste too much time. Today I want to talk about pressing on and, and what that means for us as Christians. That, uh, and, and, and the real issue, it's not just about dig deeper and take another step, though I think that's important. That used to be my running mantra on long distances. You know, when you, when you went further from home than you thought you should have and you have to get home. But, but And I think there are times in our Christian walk where that is true, that you're out there and, and uh, you can't stop, so you just dig deeper and take another step. And I, I think that's good. But this morning, I want to look at it from a little different perspective, and that is you will absolutely fail at times. But Jesus can make the difference. That when, when we think of pressing on this morning, I don't want us to just think about how we do it in our strength or how we, we get more guts and, and push on with greater fortitude, although those are all good things and we can find them in the scripture. But I want us to think about the fact that Jesus makes the difference when we fail. And, and if we think of this Christian life as a walk, and we, we do, we often call it our walk with the Lord, and... Um, in my lifetime, uh, as a Christian, you'd hear people, they'd, they'd get started on a project or a task or the, a calling. The Lord say, well, you know, I'm, they, they'd come and tell me, I'm calling you to do this or I'm calling you to do that. And, and they'd do it for a little while and decide that they misheard God. Right? Well, I guess that's not really what he meant. And, and they, well, I'm not called. I guess I'm not called to do that after all. And what they really mean is, I don't want God to call me to anything that's not easy. And if we think about it as a walk, I think about kids when they're learning to walk, toddlers, and we call them that for a reason. And, and uh, everybody, you know, the good news is everybody should learn to walk before they're potty trained because they have an extra padding with the diaper because they fall a lot. And, and how many have noticed that, you know, uh, when, a, when, a, when a child's learning to walk, 
there's, there's some stumbles, there's falls, there's crashes. It, it happens. And, and I, I, well, where would you be as an individual if when you were a toddler, you fell down and said, I guess I wasn't called to walk? But spiritually, I have witnessed that in people's lives. That, that they start out, they're, they're kind of like a toddler. They've been, they're new in the Lord they're, or what have you, and they're crawling along, and they decide, I'm going to walk, and, and God calls them to something, and they start moving forward, and they run into a bump, and it, it's a little bit of a struggle, and then I guess I'm not called to do it. And is that really where we want our goals to lead us? To a lot of dead ends because it's just too hard. And, and what about the, the, the fact that God makes a difference for you? And, and so we, we learn this. When we fall, we need to get up and continue. That's an important principle of faith. When we fall, we need to get up and continue. Stay on the path. Return to the path. Walk with Jesus. The Bible's full of examples of people who failed and pressed forward. And, and I like that, you know. I, I like the Old Testament because it's, it's just filled with examples of people who are crummy that managed to serve the Lord. I find that remarkably hopeful. That if, if, if the people of the Old Testament could overcome their nature and press on in spite of their failures, why can't we? And, and so I think of myself, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, but I just keep coming back to Jesus. Learning to get over your failures. You know, I get tired, I sometimes get lazy about my walk. Does that sound like anyone else in the room? But I keep coming back. Learning to get over your failures by trusting the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace of the Lord is key to your success as a Christian over time. No matter who you are, no matter how stowed away you are, no matter how disciplined you think you are, you will have a time when you have no hope but to depend on the merciful kindness of God. And that brings us to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 12 through 15. And it says this. It's, it's not that I've already reached the goal or have already completed the course, but I run to win that which Jesus Christ has already won for me. Brothers and sisters, I can't consider myself a winner yet. This is what I do. I don't look back. I lengthen my stride and I run straight toward the goal to win the prize that God's heavenly call offers in Christ Jesus. Whoever has a mature faith should think this way. And if you think differently, God will show you how to think. And I want to start with that last verse because it's on my mind. That, that if you, you understand what he's saying. If you have a mature faith... You will learn to stop looking back and know that you're not a winner and press forward. You will understand that what it means to be poor in spirit is that you are spiritually helpless without the influence and aid of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now I'll talk about this idea that I have not reached the goal. And, and when we think about what that means, I have not reached the goal. How does that apply to us? We understand the race is just an analogy for the Christian life. And, and I come to this. I am not completely conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is the goal. According to Romans uh, right, 8.29, 8, that we be conformed to the image of God's Son, Christ Jesus. That's his plan for everyone who would love and follow the Lord. Because 8.28 says, right, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and called according to his purposes. 
And then 29, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, Christ Jesus. And we, we come to this understanding that there is a goal that God has for us. And God's goal for you is higher than your goal for you. Uh, you know, we don't want to say it like this, but, but a lot of our approach to life is kind of like aim low, achieve your goals, avoid disappointment. Right? We kind of set goals, you know, I, and it's a healthy enough thing, honestly. I call it achievable success, but, but sometimes we're, we're like, now, I, I, I have a sickness. I generally set goals I can never achieve. And then I manage somehow to achieve a lot of them. And then everybody says, you shouldn't have done that. Look what it did to you. But, uh, but we, we kind of aim low to achieve our goals. But God has a plan. See, no one, no one would really think, well, in fact, I've heard Christians say, it. well, you can't really be like Jesus then why does God destine us to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus? If it can't happen, why is it God's goal for you? And if it is God's goal for you, we know you can't do it without him. Therefore, we press forward knowing that he comes to our rescue. And see, if I understand I have to be conformed to the image of, of Jesus Christ, I can't just settle in. And, and we're, we're people, we do that, we just settle in. And, and so I remember in high school, I, uh, I, I think it was something I needed a credit or what, I don't remember why, but for whatever reason I had an early bird uh, PE class, which is just ridiculous that you're there at 7 a.m., you know. And, and I rode my bike to school. It was three miles to get to school. I rode my bike, and, um, and I'd get there, and, and uh, the PE teacher was the track coach, and he thought anyone that signed up for that was into running. And so <laughs> think this through it so that we had a three-mile run on a regular basis. And, and uh, he, when he tested us, he said, everybody that does the run is going to get an A. I got a C. And because here's what happened. There's this, really, there this one guy that was really slow and walked most of the way, and so I just hung out with him. Because I already was told I was going to get an A if I finished. So, so I just hung out with this other guy. And I walk in, and, and, and he calls the guy's name. He says, you got an A? He says, Adams, you got a C. I said, why? He says, because every other morning you're fourth. And then the day I grade you and tell you you're going to get an A, you show up last. That's why. You just settled. And I think about us in our walk with Jesus. And people just settle in. They kind of, you know, they figure out, well, we, we kind of get to church. We've gotten rid of the big things that have been ruining our lives. And, and we're just, we got things going for us pretty well. We know how to do this Christianity stuff. And they just settle in and they try to get on autopilot. And, and that's not necessarily God's plan. In fact, I believe that the trials that people are facing in this world today uh, I think they exist to reveal what's inside. They reveal what's inside. And people are, you know, every once in a while someone says, have you ever noticed COVID seems to cause people to be crazy? No. That's not what causes craziness. It's what reveals it. It's what reveals the mask. It removes the mask. It was there. Because when you get squeezed hard, what's inside comes out. I can't consider myself as having arrived as a statement that 
that Paul makes in this passage. And, and, and we, when we think about it, the religious pharisaical mindset is such that they, 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 it's that mindset that says, I've got this, or I've, I've arrived. I know how to do this. I've got this. And if you fall into that trap, you think, I've found my rhythm and I've got this, what you have to understand, anything can interrupt that rhythm. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride precedes a disaster. An arrogant attitude precedes a fall. And I would say the famous last words of a fool is, I know what to do. I, I flashed on an acquaintance of mine, a friend of mine. I used to work with hauling chips out of the forest, you know. And uh, you have these huge chippers. And, and so we had one. It was a V12 cat that could um, chip a 30-inch tree. And, and, and it, if everything was going right, I could get 25 tons of chips in uh, 10 minutes. And uh, the chipper broke. They were changing the knives. And, and one of the mechanics was working on it and uh, and he couldn't get it loose and so this this fellow I know um, saw that and he uh, in maybe a little arrogance went up there it wasn't me it really was someone I knew <laughs> if it was me I'd just tell you because you know I'm stupid that way but um, he runs up and grabs that wrench says let me see that because he thought he was going to hurry the process pulled on it and the wrench came off, and he hit himself in the head with the wrench, knocked himself off the chipper. It was a blessing. Because, but, but I, I think I flash on things like that, and I've done some things like that too, and, and I bet you have. And, and I think in our spiritual walk, we've done that. I've got this. And then we find out, Maybe we don't. Because pride comes before a fall. And, and this idea when he says, you know, I'm not a winner yet, it, it's this word, katalambano, uh, and it means to have seized or apprehended. And, to, and it's this idea of, I haven't conquered life yet. I haven't conquered life yet. Now, some of us might be closer to the finish line than others, but we haven't conquered it. And if you think you have, something will surprise you in your life. And, and I come to this conclusion for all of us that failure is, is not just an option, it's probable. And I'm not saying you will be a failure. I'm not saying you'll go to hell. I'm saying you will fail in life. It's probable. And you, how do you know that? Well, you already have. People do. It's part of being in the human race. Don't expect that you can live perfectly. And this isn't an endorsement on sin either. And when I don't, don't think that you're going to live the perfect Christian life. You will fail. You will slip. You will have problems. And at that point, you will have to choose to get up and move forward with Jesus because you trust in his mercy and his grace and his everlasting kindness to put up with your inabilities. Nobody can live a perfect Christian life. And I mean nobody. And so when you think you've conquered this life we call Christian, you become judgmental. And as soon as we become judgmental, what have we done? Failed miserably. It's that catch-22 thing. You know, you get a button in school for being the most humble person, then you wear it and they take it away. And so we become judgmental of others. If we think we've conquered this Christian life, we start to judge others. And that's not healthy for anyone, mostly for you. And then you start to judge yourself. 
Because you think that you can do this, you judge yourself when you find out you can't. And, and, and we've heard that, you know, people make mistakes and say, oh, I'm just so stupid. Well, you know, maybe you're not a rocket scientist, but people make mistakes. And, 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 and we have an example in Scripture with Peter. That Jesus allowed Peter to be sifted so that he wouldn't think more of himself than he should. And it's an interesting process as you go through the scriptures and you see what's happening with Peter. Because something happens right away with Peter. He has a revelation, right? Uh, when, when Jesus is saying, he's asking the question, who do men say that I am? And, and, and they're saying, well, some think you're this and some think you're that, etc. And Jesus says, but who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, the, and Jesus says, you know, Peter, you're blessed because God has revealed this to you. And I'm going to start calling you Peter instead of Simon because you're going to be a rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And... And he begins to say that, and it, it had such an impact that the other disciples begin to allow him to emerge in leadership. And, and then after the Lord's gone, we see Peter really stepping forward in all of that. But right after that, what does he do? What is he, right after he recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah, he corrects him. Now that's funny right there. I perceive you're the almighty, omnipotent, all-knowing God. You're wrong. Just that fast. Because Jesus begins to tell them, I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to die. And Jesus says, oh, this can't happen. Or Peter says, this can't happen. That's the whole get behind me, Satan. And all of a sudden, Jesus starts taking Peter through a walk with his own religious pride. Have you, don't raise your hand. Have you ever had to walk along through your own religious pride? Have you ever had to walk through your own pride? Every once in a while, I've heard people say, it's not easy to have that kind of pride. It's not easy to know someone with it. And then, and then the Lord makes you walk through it and he starts showing you things. And you find out that God might have a plan that's specific for you, but it doesn't make you better than the next guy. And so that happens with Peter, and it starts with the Lord promises to, you know, is promising Peter to have a problem. <laughs> And it starts at Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, right? Then the Lord said, Simon, Simon, listen, Satan has demanded to have you apostles for himself. He wants to separate you from me as a farmer separates wheat from husk. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. So when you recover, strengthen the disciples. Now we learn from that. And, and Peter responds, by the way, like, <laughs> you don't have anything to worry about, Jesus. I've got this. Because if, well, it's, it's right here, verse 32. Well, verse 32, Jesus says, I prayed for you when you returned strength in your brethren. Verse 33, Peter said, but Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and to die with you. In other words, I have got this. Remember, I'm, I'm the rock. You, you named me that? I've got this. And Jesus says, well, you know, that's fine, but you're going to betray me. You're going to renounce me and deny that you know me before the roosters crowed three times. And it goes like that. And in another gospel, when Jesus is talking about it, uh, in Matthew 26, we look at verse 31. It says, then Jesus said to them, all of you will abandon me tonight. Scripture says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep and the flock will be scattered. But after, I've brought back, after I'm brought back to life, I will go to Galilee ahead of you. Peter said to him, even if everyone else abandons you, I never will. He's just asking for it. And so the first 
part of this walk, when the Lord walks you through your religious pride, is he reveals it to you. And the problem is this. When the Lord reveals your religious pride to you, everyone else will see it first. You'll be the last to know. Peter makes a ridiculous statement in front of everyone. It got recorded for history. He hadn't figured it out yet. He figures it out later in the breakfast by the sea. And that, you know, of course, Jesus replies in that same passage, I can guarantee this truth before the rooster crows, etc. And, and, and the story goes on, right? So then Jesus comes to get arrested, or, the, the, excuse me, the priests, the guards of the temple come to arrest Jesus. And uh, Peter decides he's going to prove Jesus wrong, right? Let's fight now, and he cuts off a guy's ear. And if it was on purpose, he's really good at it. And if it wasn't, he's really bad at it. But Jesus rebukes him. He says, put your glock away. And he heals his ear. That was a euphemism to modernize our understanding of it. And he says, anyone who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And he heals Melchizedek's ear. And, um, or excuse me, I got that wrong. The, the servant of the high priest here. Malchus, thank you. And um, and now Peter's feeling bad. And they all leave Jesus alone. But then John and, and Peter follow along and, and they get inside the temple courtyard and Peter's there watching what's happening with Jesus. And and some people start coming and, you, you know, you've heard the story and and. Different ones are coming to him. It happens three times. Hey, you were with him. You're one of his disciples. And each time he says, I don't know him. I wasn't me. And in one, one of the passages in the gospel, it says, oh, you're one of them. Your speech betrays you. And he starts to cuss and swear and say, I don't know him. And then he's broken, and he weeps bitterly, and he feels poorly, and all of that. And, and the, then we see this encounter. The next time Jesus and Peter interact is in the last chapter of the book of John. John 21, and, and it's called The Breakfast by the Sea. And uh, they, they're out fishing, because, you know, once Jesus died, and all of that, and Peter said, I'm going fishing. And, and uh, what we don't realize is he wasn't just, well, I'm going to do a little fly fishing to melt my stress. He was going back to his old way of earning money. He was a fisherman before Jesus. He was going back to his old career. Because, you know, it was a good three and a half years. Now it's over. I'm going to go back and do this. And while they're out fishing... Jesus calls out to him, and there's another miracle with the fish being caught that is overloading the boats. And they realize it's Jesus, and Peter swims ashore. And then now they're by the, the fire, and there's fish on the coals cooking. And Jesus asks the question, and we're going to read that in John 21, 15. It says, after they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than the other disciples do? Peter, Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus told him, feed my lambs. Note the question, the first question that was so important. Do you love me more than other disciples do? And if you're careless, you will always say, yes, I do. And at some point, you will have to discover that you might not. You say, well, how do you learn humility? It's usually through the process of humiliation. It's the very definition if you think about it. Why does pride come before a fall? Because the grace of God teaches humility. 
And it's in the fall that you learn it. And we come to this understanding that when you're running the race, you can't spend your time thinking about what you've done wrong in the race. And we can get caught in that trap because we look at Peter, and so here's the deal. We look at Peter, and basically he was a, he was a pretty good failure. He became a fair-weather friend, but he got back on the path. And you can you can say, well, well, you just don't know. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been like. You don't. But if you read the scriptures, you can discover some pretty rotten people that God embraced. You can discover some tremendous failures that God forgave. And He's not finished because it's in His heart, and it should be in ours. So we, we can't always just look back and say, well, you know, I failed, I failed. And, and if we spend all our time looking back at our failures, we don't go forward. Romans 8, 3 says, for what was impossible for the law in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And, and we begin to realize the weak link of the law is us our ability to follow it. But I've always loved that phrase, what what the law could not do, God did. And, and, And we really understand what I can't do through my own strength, through my own power, through my own fortitude, God did. God did. And somewhere in there, two things should begin to happen. I should give myself some room, and I should give people room. We have to trust in this. Because to not trust in it is to attempt to earn salvation that we can never earn and always fail at doing. You can't spend your time moving forward by looking back. Yes, first of all, yes, you have made mistakes. Yes, you will make mistakes. You know, I've made some tremendous mistakes and lived in rebellion against the Lord when I was a young fellow and all of that. And... uh, my goal in life as a parent was to keep my children from making mistakes. It didn't work. Well, I don't want them to have to deal with and struggle with the things I dealt with and struggled with. But did God have a purpose? Did he get you? Did he find you in that struggle? And, you know, we, we like that passage in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts I think towards you, the plans I make, thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a, a hope and a future, right? I, I call it a, a future hoped for because that's the idea in the actual Hebrew. But um, it's the expected end. But do you know who doesn't get to make plans for you to get you to the future hoped for? You. You don't, and neither do your parents. And you don't get to do it for your kids because God has done it. God has done it. And, and maybe you don't always like how he approaches it. But when you can make your own universe, you get to be in charge. And so we we come to this thing where we we realize we make mistakes, but God doesn't. And I have to trust in that. And, and you know, uh, we celebrated our anniversary recently, the church anniversary, 28 years. And and in 28 years of pastoring this church, I've come to that, I came to that understanding that uh, 
God doesn't make mistakes, and I have to trust that in people's lives. I have to trust that in people's lives. That's hard to do. How many know that's hard to do? Does that mean we shouldn't? No, we have to. It's our hope. And, and so we come to this, this thing, we must press towards the goal. The goal isn't to settle in. Your goal is not to get comfortable. Your goal is to press towards the calling, the, uh, the prize, the high calling of Jesus Christ, which is what? To be conformed to his image. And, and where, did, where did it happen in, the, in Christianity and, and in Western Christianity and American Christianity and the American church, where did it happen that the goal of God's people came to a place of being comfortable and having things go their way in church? How did we get there when God said the goal was the prize, the high calling of Jesus? And, you know, I, I remember, you know, as a young pastor, I didn't know how to deal with things very well. And I know that because I'm an old pastor and I don't. And, uh, but, but, you know, I was 22 when I started. And uh, this old gal started coming to our church and uh, because her husband, Preston, just had to be fed. He wasn't getting fed at the other church. And then I, uh, I stepped on someone's toes and, they had to go back to their old church because Preston needed to be fed. Right? And uh, I, I was, that flashed across my mind. Here's what I came to. The goal isn't to be fed. The goal is to walk with Jesus. And, and you can say, well, Charles, you know, and I've heard this and I'm not, and I'm not ungrateful for it, but I'll, I've heard people say, well, Charles, you know, your preaching is really good and it really feeds us. That's not the goal of preaching. You know, the goal of preaching is not to satisfy your spiritual hunger or your religious desires. It's to push you towards the cross. It doesn't matter if you're fed. It doesn't matter if you're satisfied. What matters is, are you being pushed towards Jesus? And are you going to go that direction? And people say, well, well I, had a good, I had a good day in church. Well, the real question is, did God have a good day in church? Well, well, I enjoyed worship. Well, that's fine, but it wasn't directed towards you. It was directed towards him. Did God enjoy worship? You say, well, I didn't get anything out of worship. We weren't singing to you. I mean, just how important do you think you are? There is a finish line. Keep going that direction. So, you know, I've walked with, I can't remember, I've been married 41 years. Blissful years that just seemed like 10. And, uh, you know, you might call that insincere, but it doesn't matter as long as it works. But, uh, and it may not now that I said that, but uh, I've been married 41 years and I, I think I probably got saved a year or two before that. And, uh, and I could say, well, I've been saved 43 years. And, and I haven't gotten everything I wanted out of Christianity. But that's not why I got saved. And I also haven't reached the finish line. I haven't finished that race. Well, I'm not getting what I need from the church. 
Is God getting what he needs from you? I have a, a, a colleague, uh, when he was an associate pastor, he was co- taking the calls in the office and, and uh, down south, and he got a call, and this, this person was investigating the church, right? What, what's your church like? We're moving to the area. What does your church have to offer us and everything? And he's listening to the questions, and he didn't answer it. The, the, the gals said, well, what's your church have to offer us? He says, well, I'm going to answer that with a question. What do you have to offer our church? He says, all you're asking is what you're going to get from us. What do you have to give to the work that God's doing here? He never met her. Which probably was the blessing that God planned. Proverbs 16.20 says this. Whoever gives attention to the Lord's word prospers, and blessed is the person who trusts the Lord. I think that's true. I think that's true no matter what is happening in my life. I think it's true no matter what circumstances I am facing. I think it's true. The race, the Bible says, is not to the swift. So we know it's to the diligent. You will get there. And, and you know, if you've competed in anything like that, you, you know that, uh, I'll tell you, whether it was cycling or running, the, my thing is always the first 15, 20 minutes are horrible. Right? Especially in the morning, because all the broken parts wake up last. And, and you know, that first 20 minutes is murder. When I was running, it's like the first two and a half miles was just, oh, I hate this. Why am I out here? And then the toxins go away and you think, I could do this all day. Well, this is great. I love this. And then you, if you go far enough, it happens again. <laughs> Why am I out here? What is wrong with me? I hate this. And then you get through it and it's like, oh, this is good. That's, that's probably why the Bible... And compares the Christian walk to a race. <coughs> because we have that. We have those times where it's like, this is miserable. And then we bump through it and it's like, this is great. I love this. I can do this all the time forever. And then and a little while down the road, it's like, what am I doing here? But we are people of faith, not feeling. <clears throat> Didn't want to drink in front of you, but I'm going to. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, that we may respond to your faithful promises. That we will not be people who feel, but we will be people who know by faith. That we move forward and we press on knowing and trusting in who you are, that you are able to keep that which we commit to you. That in and of ourselves, we know we can't do it. But we also know that in your presence, we can. And I just pray for every discouraged person this morning. That they will just press on trusting in who Jesus is. In your name, amen. Lord bless you. We'll see you next time.